Hello, everyone. Well, there's so many of you. This is our very first time in Chicago. We took more than 20 hours flight from our hometown in Jakarta, Indonesia, to be here. A bit of a jet lag, but we are very excited to share today what we learned on growing our internal developer platform for companies inside companies. My name is Giri, and here's my colleague, Joshua. Both of us are infrastructure engineers from GoToFinancial. GoToFinancial is a financial arm of Goto Group, the leading digital ecosystem in Indonesia. Our ecosystem provides uh, various service offerings from ride hailing service using motorcycle, bike taxi uh, service, food delivery service, um, package delivery service, e-commerce, and, and many others. For today, we are focusing mostly on the GoToFinancial case study. When the company was just started, we, we created a, a product called GoPay from the ground up. This GoPay is a digital payment uh, product to serve uh, the use case of our customers to enable them to pay cashless when they order services in our ecosystem. GoPay right now is one of the largest payment companies in Southeast Asia. As the business grows, the GoPay engineering organization grows to more than 230 plus developers spread across 30 different teams. We maintain 30 different Kubernetes clusters across uh, multiple cloud providers and data centers. These clusters became the foundation of our cloud native infrastructure. As our team grows, the scale grows, and the cloud native community is moving really, really fast. As an infrastructure team, we always want to introduce something new that we learn from the community to our infrastructure. This makes our infrastructure more and more complex every day, and developers suffer from the things that we ask them to, let's say, bumping their helm charts. There was a time when we asked them to bump helm charts like three times a day to prepare for, let's say, 1.16 Kubernetes might upgrade and, and so on. It took us a few years to realize that we had to create platform to abstract this complex infrastructure. We started building this abstraction three years back with two purposes. First purpose was we wanted to shield the developers from learning curve of Kubernetes and its ecosystem. And on the other side, we as an infrastructure team uh, would want to maintain and govern infrastructure easily across our fleet of Kubernetes clusters. So how does our platform abstraction looks like? We expose an interface that developers or product engineers use on a daily basis. This is nothing but a UI portal, a simple interface, and we expose only what the product engineers need instead of exposing entire Kubernetes YAMLs for them to configure and apply in our clusters. On the other side, um, we, the infra engineers or platform engineers, maintain a set of standardized uh, Kubernetes templates for our use case we maintain a, a, a couple of Helm charts that are standard across our infrastructure. This creates separation of concern between what matters to product engineers and what matters to infrastructure engineers. The platform then orchestrates the inputs that product engineers have provided us using the UI portal. Combined with the standard Helm charts that we have, we generate the Kubernetes manifest, push it in our central GitOps repository and leverage Argo CD to sync applications across the clusters that we have. Through this abstraction, this platform, the product engineers are able to run their applications, scale the replicas of their uh, workloads, routing canary traffic to their workloads, adjusting CPU memory size without writing single YAMLs or modifying single YAMLs. So we only expose what matters to product engineers through this UI portal. The impact of this abstraction for the couple of, uh, for the past two, three years, we were able to roll out um, Istio that we learned, I think, uh, two years back to 100% of our services in infrastructure, which is around 1,000 applications, within only a year. We were able to remove deprecated Kubernetes APIs prepared for our upgrades when there's a breaking change. Um, the community deprecate beta APIs easily without developers knowing. So we are more disciplined in upgrading our clusters regularly. We were able to schedule to move the workloads to on-demand instances to our pool of spot instances. We made this self-service through our platform, so it becomes easy for developers to, to, to make 
make it more efficient in running their application. And finally, we were able to improve the utilization of our clusters through automating resource adjustments regularly in our infrastructure. This abstraction, this platform grows into a developer platform inside our company. We call this internally as GoPSH developer platform. This, the platform consists of uh, five different planes in our architecture. First plane is what we call developer control plane. This is the main interface, the gateway for product engineers to interact with our uh, infrastructure and set of toolings. This is nothing but a common UI portal where developers can configure their application and associated components. The second plane is integration and delivery plane. This plane is responsible for building the application code into um, image, container image artifact, push it to image registry that we maintain, and leverage Argo CD to roll out those images across the environments and clusters that we maintain in our infrastructure. The third plane is monitoring and logging plane. This helps developers in debugging, troubleshooting, and monitoring their uh, running applications across the environments. And the last, the fourth plane is security plane. This plane is responsible, uh, uh, help us in governing resources access across the infrastructure that we maintain and managing our secrets. These four planes are working, collaborate closely together, making it a, a management plane, management layer, which eventually creates, edits, and sometimes delete the real resources in our infrastructure across Kubernetes pods and virtual machines. We make our platform extensible through implementation of open service broker, API specification. We have a concept called add-ons marketplace. Each add-on is maintained by different, different infrastructure teams across the organizations. And sometimes product engineers also contribute to these add-ons that they want to make it available across the organizations. With this concept, they don't need to make changes to our front end code base. And because there's a JSON schema concept, um, provided from the backend, we could generate the UI form in the portal without asking them to contribute to our uh, common code base. And then through this add-ons marketplace, um, product engineers are able to do uh, anything beyond Kubernetes deployment. So things like provisioning Redis, provisioning database, resizing their disk, day to operations, configuring logging, and exposing domain to public sometimes exposing domain to our third-party partners, they are able to do everything from this UI portal without knowing too much details. And we are able to separate the lifecycle between the core platform and each of the add-ons lifecycle because, they, because of this extension mechanism. As the business grows uh, and to support the business expansion, we acquired multiple companies. We acquired a company called Midtrans. This is an online payment gateway company to support our online payment use cases. We acquired Mocha. This is a point of sale system company to support our offline integrations across merchants in Indonesia, the whole Indonesia. We acquired multiple lending companies to support our uh, GoPay later, the lending business installment features in our app. And we acquired a few other companies and made tight integration strategic partnerships with other institutions. And these are uh, becoming go-to financial family. While these acquired companies provide critical contributions to our business, they gave us a challenge, Infratima challenge. Each of these acquired company has their own independent infrastructure team or platform team. What are the problems with this independent infra team? There's a couple of problems. First, there's a very high variance of our infrastructure stack and toolings that are used across GoToFinancial despite we are working closely together, collaborate together to maintain the products. So for instance, some companies use Helm and Customize to deploy their Kubernetes manifest. Some are using Flux CD. And for us, we are leveraging Argo CD a lot as a standard. This creates unnecessary frictions to collaborate across engineering organizations. Imagine the monitoring dashboards are very fragmented. Company A has their own monitoring dashboard. The other companies have their own monitoring dashboards. So it's very hard to correlate when there's, a sh there's an incident. It's very hard to correlate one service to another service if the services are spread across engineering organizations. We identify these infra teams are redundant. They are trying to achieve the same thing, to serve and help making product engineers' life better. And these redundant tools provide us with cost-saving opportunities. So to solve these problems, we decided to consolidate the infrastructure team from each infra team, independent infra team, we consolidate to be one infra or platform team 
common shared team that serves not only one product, not only one engineering organization, but supports the entire organiz uh, engineering organizations across Goto Financial. So we try to do more with less. However, again, consolidation gives us challenges. So when we talk to each of the, uh, to, to many engineers uh, in each of the organizations, we learn what are the differences in their practices, what are the gaps, what are the use cases that we haven't covered yet in our platform. We had a dilemma. The dilemma was this. We, whether we extend our developer platform to support their new use cases or negotiate, ask them to deprecate their existing tools, existing practice, and adopt uh, what we have uh, at the moment. Another challenge is that because we are running in a very highly regulated industry, the financial industry, each company must comply to different set of regulations. So for instance, for our payment business, we need to comply with the Central Bank of Indonesia uh, regulations. For our lending business, we need to comply with Financial Services Authority, which give sometimes set of different compliance requirements from the Central Bank. And for our payment gateway, we need to comply with the PCI DSS standards. We got lucky, all of these acquired companies are already running on Kubernetes. They have containers, their applications completely. So this makes them a good candidate to onboard to our developer platform. And their Kubernetes clusters are running across the GCP, AWS, and private DNA center. Next, Joshua is going to share our consolidation journey and how we onboard these acquired companies to our developer platform. Okay, um, thank you, Giri, for the great introduction. So what do we mean by when we say that we are going to onboard the workloads of the other team to our platform? Giri has just mentioned that, fortunately, all of the companies that we are going to onboard are already using Kubernetes, right? So this means that the respective companies and team has made sure that their workloads are able to run on top of Kubernetes, and most importantly, containerized. We had an experience back then where we had to onboard workloads from VM to Kubernetes, and it was way more painful indeed. This means that there's already a running Kubernetes cluster with live workloads, with incoming production traffic, and we were thinking, in order to make the process faster and more efficient, why don't we just use these existing cluster rather than creating, creating new ones from scratch? So the first thing that we do to enable and unlock the features of GoPSH on a particular Kubernetes cluster is that we are installing several operator, controller, and agent that is needed on the cluster and correspond to our product offerings. Each of these cluster is interestingly managed as its own Argo CD application. We then define several namespaces that we label as GoPSH manage. So let's say for the workloads that are going to be deployed to this GoPSH namespace, they will be auto-injected with Istio Sidecar. Namespace, in our use case, are mapped to the structure of the team for the visibility of cost, versioning, resource tagging, and other. And if possible, if we see a potential of clusters being merged, we merge them. So let's say that there were no blocker of compliance, and turns out that services from the different companies are serving the same purposes, then less cluster to manage. The second thing is the theme itself. We define particular Google groups where the infra team and developers are part of it, and then we add them to the larger Google group as the users of our platform. We proceed with the creation of the namespace, and then we define the RBAC. So let's say product engineers will have limited just view-only access to the Kubernetes cluster, no edit, no delete, on a default scenario, they can see their running workloads on our Argo CD dashboard that we expose, and they can also file just-in-time access requests for emergency, while the infer team will have the privilege access for the clusters. Currently, the way that product engineers use GoPSH as their deployment tool is that they copy a deployment script that will be available on the UI portal to their repository pipeline configuration which will trigger a GoPSH client binary that will call our deployment API. This call will retrieve and pass several metadata, like what's the name of the services, in which cluster and namespaces that they want to deploy this to, and most importantly is the URL of the container image from an artifact registry. And since has, uh, that has been mentioned that all the companies are already using Kubernetes, this info of, and the, they already have their own way to build and containerize their application, Thus, their repository will already have this information of this uh, container image that we can just utilize. If they want to create a new application, they can also uh, pro uh, create new one from scratch, and we also provide a uniform way to build, like let's say with predefined base image. 
So the gap usually lies and discovered in the structure of Helm chart because this usually reflects the nuts and bolts of the running surfaces. These differences to the one that we centrally manage by our infra team. So for example, we found that in other companies, they are using the deployment uh, with the type of stable, stateful set for their corresponding use cases. Or on others, their services need file mount for their Java application for its startup configuration process. We knew that there won't be any workaround or other approach for this kind of needs and use cases. Thus, we need to extend our support of our platform to be able to accommodate this scenario. Okay, monitoring, logging, and alerting. This is essential for product engineers to, be, to enable them analyze their, the health of their running services and debug when there's any kind of production issue. On our side, our infrastructure team hosted our in-house ELK stack. For custom metrics, since we have already supported either the push method of statsd exporter to Victoria metrics, or the pull method, where developers can send data to, let's say, a particular slash metrics endpoint, in which the, then it will be scraped by an agent. Hence, developers from the other team can just use either of these methods according to their needs, which, whichever they find the most comfortable to. And one of the interesting things that we encounter on this onboarding journey is that some, to, some of the companies need to uh, comply to a certain regulation, as has been, have been mentioned, right? In which we will have to make sure that all of the data, including the metrics data, to be located locally in Indonesia. So we make changes that previously our agent pushed the metrics data to our central infrastructure cluster, but now we reverse it by pulling the VM cluster data on the respective local cluster. So metrics data can stay there, but monitoring dashboards are still intact and accessible. For logging, we found some companies that are writing their application log to files, so we encourage them to write to STD out instead, as favorable by the 12-factor app standards. Some are having their own log parser that act as a, as a sidecar, so in case rather than we try to extend our support to be able to add another sidecar other than the Istio injected one, we port this log parser to our existing TD agent daemon set. So there are some considerations that we can abide by if we encounter these kind of gaps and differences in this onboarding journey. The first one is that if there's already a guideline that if not all, perhaps most of the developer, members of the developer community has agreed that it has indeed some upsides and benefits, there seem to be no reason as why not to follow this existing so-called golden path. The second one is definitely compliance. Fintech is a highly regulated one, as has been mentioned, so if there's a need for that, we definitely can't say no to putting effort in making that to comply, because or else our company can't operate. The third one, if we found a discrepancy, which means changes needs to be made either on our side as a platform or on their side, both in terms of their workloads and infrastructure, we all need to be aware that we should keep it to the minimum, because we are sure that other than consolidation, they already have and busy with developing and supporting their business as usual processes. And the last one I think is the big theme that is applicable to most companies in the recent times that I think most of us in the room, the infrastructure team can relate to. This kind of consolidation event, or even if there isn't any that is currently going on in your company, if your company has scaled to a point where silos are likely to happen across teams, it might be a good reason, it might be a good opportunity to audit and recap once in a while, what are the technologies and the engineering culture that, happens, that, that is happening across teams? Like even if autonomy is a good thing, that every team has its own flavor of way of doing things, it surely has to support a bigger goal and backed by a strong reason. So let's say productivity and redundancy or context switching, it's not one of them. Yeah, I want to mention that either the decision to support or deprecate these technologies are oftentimes, and especially in our case, highly contextual. It is definitely not a testament to the quality of the services and the products that we mentioned in itself, but more often than not, it's about the capacity, the bandwidth, the familiarity and experiences that the teams already had. So how are we making this consolidation to happen? The first thing that we do is that we create a task force that comprises of the one to two members of each of the smaller team in our infrastructure department in which they will be responsible for the whole consolidation journey and will have regular cadences with the engineering representative for each of the respective companies. We knew that if we want to go far, we need to go together. So finding allies and having their buy-ins are playing a big part in making this consolidation successful. 
one thing that we learn is buy-in needs to work both ways to the leadership and also to the engineering teams. We want to make sure that this long process of consolidation will at the very end have the goal to benefit all of the parties. And for that to be able to be understood, we need to talk in their languages. Even to the most technically proficient management, if they understand how it works, they are less likely to be able to convince, let's say, the upper leadership or C-level if we weren't talking about perhaps cost or better productivity and how this will benefit the company going forward. For other product engineers and infra team, this happened with making sure that they are convinced that their lives are to be made easier, both in the process of onboarding itself and also after. We are achieving this by several things like finding the right balance on how we cover the gap and making sure that the product offerings of our infra team is something that will be useful for them all. For example, we found that the product engineers of the onboarded teams, they are highly interested in the feature of in our feature of canary deployment with the traffic weight and routing that will be able to be used by every user of our platform out of the box once they are getting onboarded. And for the infra team, they even admit that it is painful in creating and managing certificates manually. They are drawn to our centralized cert management. The vertical cooperation to leadership is what we call mandate and the horizontal one to the engineers is what we call movements. Sometimes we tend to just focus on one thinking that winning one side will help us to win the other side, which might not be the case. In our scenario, we found that winning both of them are equally important. Along the journey, we found several people that I'm going to borrow this term we call, we could call allies. People that are convinced by the vision and the goal of this consolidation that shows enthusiasm and are willing to help. We found them both in leadership when we present to them which later they help us by giving guidance and alignment to the engineering team that they manage. We found them in project engineers and infra team that they can see the, be the benefit from this consolidation as well. We do this over impromptu lunches, sharing sessions, and whatnots. Usually onboarding of these companies are done in several steps. We start with discovery analysis of what gaps are there between what our infrastructure can serve and what they're expecting. We pick two to three services and try to onboard them to our platform as the proof of concept. Then we proceed with the preparation for the platform and the cluster as has, as has been mentioned. Planning is done by picking the least critical surfaces, educating the service owner and the infra team, and then we estimate the duration of how long the onboarding process might take. When we onboard the workload, this is done by creating the exact copy of the running workload, a workload to the GoPSH managed namespace, which, is, which can be easily be achieved by our GoPSH platform UI portal. We then check with the service owner whether, and the infra team whether the onboard service already meets their expectations, like whether the connectivity is already there, whether one service could already talk to one another, logging on monitor, on, and monitoring are present on the dashboard or not. Then we do cut over by rerouting the call destination of the client, removing the workload, deprecate the older pipeline. Then the last, uh, we make sure that handover of all process and components managed and all the information related to it are being documented well so that it can be passed to the respective team later. We make the workload onboarding very easy with just several steps and clicks through our UI portal. They can just input their running workload name. The portal will call the Kubernetes API that will retrieve the object-related data and specification. So let's say expose application port or probe configuration, CPU memory resources. We'll store it on our end, and then this will generate the deployment script on the UI portal, and then they can just copy-paste the script to be triggered later from the repository for the deployment of their workload. So an interesting story here, as has been mentioned, the initial motivation in us uh, building the GoPSH platform is for us to be able to go onboard the existing GoPay workloads that was already on Kubernetes, to be using Surface Mesh with Istio. That was why we already had the experience of trying to onboard live production workloads of product engineers serving live traffic with zero downtime, which was why we also made the onboarding really easy as have shown on the previous slide. Giri and my other colleague Imre was talking about this uh, in depth in the previous KubeCon LA. We tried this manual way of tracking all of the surfaces and spreadsheet and circulating info and guidance to the product engineers. And after a painful 12 months, that miserably failed and the initi initiative got stopped, which turns out that is bound to happen again. So all the, none of the companies that we are currently on board, uh, none of them are using Istio. 
and the initial reaction that is that they are hesitant to it. Um, they were asking what would happen to their workloads. Would there be any downtime? More cost? And if we, if we try to think from their perspective and try to put ourselves in their shoes, that is very understandable because we're going to change the way how a running workload, which must be up 24 seven, that serves millions, how, how they are running to, is to be changed. Our journey with leveraging Istio in production of three years might not be long compared to others, but through the experience, we embody this in the way we are, we are onboarding them to our surface mesh enabled platform. Like we pick a surface and make them as POC, and then they can see the benefits and upsides that they can get. We pair with them through regular cadence. We also use data back arguments in response to their inquiries. So the two most, uh, the, the two questions that we get the most is that if we introduce more components, wouldn't that mean that it will have more infra cost? And the second one is that if we introduce a proxy in front of their layer, doesn't it mean more latency? From our experience, these two are negligible, and the benefits of using Istio way outweighs these two concerns. So let's say they will have a linear code that their application code does not have to handle all the things related to network and security. They can have canary deployment that will route a smaller percentage of their production surfaces, uh, production traffic. They will have the surface graph of Kiali and Jaeger to visualize the surfaces call and the other mountains of wealth of metrics generated by Istio and Envoy in regards to the application. All of these doesn't even exist on their setup and application earlier, but they can get these out of the box by just getting on board to our platform. Now Giri will continue the story with the current result of the consolidation that is still in progress. So how did we do with the consolidation so far? We are still in the middle of consolidation. We are currently migrating. We have migrated uh, more than 700 services to our platform, including uh, 11 clusters and eight teams across the acquired companies. We have started this consolidation activity since the middle 2023 this year. We have deprecated 10 redundant tools and we have identified, discovered 50 more tools can be deprecated. We have deprecated more than 20 Helm charts. And before this, we have deprecated more than 100 charts. We have freed up 30 developers across these companies, so they get more bandwidth to prioritize working on their product features. And because we were able to um, deprecate redundant tools, we've seen the reduction in our license spending collectively under the GoTo Financial family. This consolidation activity adds more workloads and responsibility to our infra team. Right now, we maintain around 50 Kubernetes clusters across AWS, GCP, and private data center in Singapore and in Indonesia region. This consists more than 700 compute nodes and 30,000 pods. This adds extra workload to our Argo CD. Currently, our Argo CD is centralized, single instance Argo CD, which obviously hits the scalability issue. We had to tune the performance of our Argo CD along the way. Right now, our central Argo CD is responsible for um, 11,000 applications, 6,000 repositories, around 60 projects, and watching more than 380,000 objects. I'll be talking uh, more about this with my other colleague tomorrow, uh, how we tune our central Argo CD instance. If you are interested, please come to uh, our talk at 11 a.m. tomorrow. To recap, there are three takeaways from our talk today. First, consolidating tools whether it's uh, teams or acquired companies, definitely bring cost benefits. We were able to recover productivity by freeing up developers to work on what matters to them and improve collaboration through utilizing uh, the shared toolings and shared dashboards across engineering organizations. Second, finding allies were very, very helpful across the companies and engineering organizations. So we were able to address the gaps early and getting the requirements before we start the project and decide whether to add support to our platform or ask them to deprecate. And these allies are helping us um, in advocating for adoption within their respective uh, engineering organization. Finally, we favor uh, rolling this out consolidation through movements. As we've seen how we rolled out platform for the first time organically within the organization because of the simplicity that we offered but sometimes there are teams or organizations that are a bit hesitant, um, that are a bit unconvinced. We had to ask the leadership for sponsorship and mandates to at least speed up this alignment and starting the discussions. 
we are heavily inspired by similar journey in Expedia, and we referred a lot to guidance by Elastic, JFrog, and Google. Thank you for having us. Um, we are happy to take questions. We still have five minutes. Please scan the QR to leave the feedback for our session. Thank you. Yeah, so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, how you manage app developers code versus the configuration you're managing for all the infrastructure that backs it. I think you mentioned a single repository or something. Is, is all the configuration actually centralized across all those applications or how are you organizing that? Does the question make sense? Yeah, um, good question. I'll repeat the question. How do we manage the application configuration? Uh, the configuration for each application, right? Whether it's a one big monorepo or separate repository, we use a kind of mix of them. So because through this portal, right? This portal, we have, a, let's say, uh, users want to create an application through our platform. We usually generate the repository for one application. This one repository application is, is nothing but a GitOps repository, which can, be, uh, which can contain multiple subdirectories to multiple target clusters that they want to connect to. Let's say uh, there's a staging cluster, production cluster, production Singapore, production Indonesia. So there's a, a, a smaller, smaller directory structures within the application. This, this application uh, repository, we generate the manifest and push it to this repository. So um, these are the ones that our GoCD applications get synced to. Similarly, if we have, let's say, 1,000 applications, there will be 1,000 repositories to, to manage the GitOps repository. On, on the other side, um, in, in, a, in, a, in an earlier slide, there was a cluster runtime standardization. For the cluster runtime standardization, uh, we use monorepo. So one repo for the, for the base layer of uh, the layers components in, the, in order for cluster runtime to work on, that we do monorepo. So uh, tomorrow, there's a, there's a technique. How do we um, tune performance for Agor CD in monorepo and also multiple repos? It's a, it's a different problems that they give us. <laughs> Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? You can use the mic. Great talk. Um, how are you guys managing uh, environment promotion? Do you guys visualize that for developers in your UI portal? And maybe a little bit more information around that. All right, the question is, how do we manage promotion across environments? Um, so far, we haven't abstracted our pipelines yet. So we leverage a lot. Uh, in existing uh, pipelines. Some of the teams are using uh, GitLab runners, GitLab CI CD, some are using GitHub Actions. So as long as they have a job that fetches our GoPlaces binary, which runs and call our APIs, that's good for now. But the next roadmap, we're planning to bring that into our platform because it's getting harder, right, to control the, the flows and standardize the flows. That's our, our next plan, actually. Thank you. Have you run into an issue with managing multiple networks with the acquisition of customers? Like, for instance, with the PC, I know that was a big issue we had to deal with with that network segmentation with on-prem and cloud. How are you dealing with that? That's a very great question. How do we manage uh, network connectivity across acquired companies? And for us, one of the companies require PCI DSS. For the ones require PCI DSS, for now, we don't touch the network. So they stay as is, they have DMZ network, stay as is, we haven't consolidated networking yet. So for how, how, how do our Argo CD, single instance Argo CD connect to those target clusters? Um, and obviously if we create tunnels to each, tunnel mass to each of the target clusters, it's, it's a headache, right? It's, there's no guarantee. Their CIDR network ranges um, are unique to what we already have. So, um, uh, so far, right now, we prefer um, public network over MTLS so that we don't need um, to, to ensure the, the unique uh, network to connect between them. Uh, MTLS makes, us, makes it very easy for us to connect to target clusters. And because we are already running Istio, in Istio it's very easy to, to, to manage the MTLS connectivity with uh, auto-renewal certificates and, and so on. I hope that answers your question. Next question. Good time. Um, I'm just curious, one of your slides, uh, you mentioned saving 30 developers for, by migrating onto your development platform. I'm just curious how you quantified that. Well, it's, it's quite easy. Um, 
in each of the acquired company, they have their infrastructure teams. Like uh, certain numbers are there, uh, 30, 30 infra engineers spread across acquired companies. We don't take them into uh, our common, uh, common team. So they get to work on, uh, uh, focus on the product works on their, their group. That's basically how we, how we do it. All right, I think uh, the time is up. We'll uh, continue questions in hallway track. Thank you so much.